Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to the Leadership Impact Forum. Congratulations, Anne and the entire team at Ascend for this amazing work. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight, but I hope to be there the next time. A special hello to the inaugural class of Ascend Fellows. I can't wait to see you all again in person. My name is Vivian Nixon. I'm writer in residence at the Square One Project. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the personal nature of racism. The need to dismantle systemic racism in the United States couldn't be more urgent. In the midst of giant sized political challenges, the call to eradicate white supremacy and the inequality it feeds is daunting and some would say unachievable without violent revolution. But I am challenging us to remember that racism causes emotional and physical harm to the minds and bodies of human beings. The battle to end racism is also personal. Racially charged stress can show up as overachievement, underachievement, reckless abandon, emotional detachment, or the inability to safely bring a child into this world. I choose to believe that justice fighters who are most in danger of losing their lives can join with people who will work to change policies within systems and agree on one thing. Racism is not the legacy we want to leave behind. Subtle racism sneaks into our lives. It damages the human spirit in ways that continue into adulthood. Microaggressions are key reminders that when we wrestle against the mammoth foundations of white supremacy, a seemingly unmovable force, we are also confronting racism daily as individuals. Facing the truth about the function of racism in history and in real time requires vulnerability and a capacity to see the value in every person. Even when we differ on methods and politics, the power to choose a North Star that does not include the assumption of white dominance lies in the hands of people, people who have caused harm and people who have been harmed. Self is a good place to start. I was born in 1960. It was impossible to escape the pressures of blackness. Awareness that blackness is a context in which white dominance identifies you as inferior. That is a pervasive theme in my messy collection of early memories. By the time I was in fifth grade, I had lived through the deaths of JFK, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X. One day when I was in the 10th grade, my friend Bumpy and I were running into the school's main hallway. It was after recess. We were breathless and talking loudly. Bumpy asked me to borrow a pencil. I ain't got no extra pencils, I said. She headed to her classroom and I to mine. Miss W stood at the entrance to my classroom, arms folded, looking down at me with disapproving eyes. Miss W was the first black teacher in our school district. That was a big deal in 1969. The 1970 census has the minority population at 8%. The town was 92% white and its systems were built for their children. On the last day of vacation Bible school that year, Reverend Brown had told us kids, Mrs. Woodard might be your teacher and we fought hard to get her in the school district. So the best you kids could do is behave. 
don't give white folk a reason to get rid of her. And now here I was face to face with Miss Woodard and her face didn't look so happy. She had overheard me say, I ain't got no extra pencil. She addressed the correction to the whole class. Please refer to the lesson on double negative, she said. If you say, I ain't got no pencil, you are actually saying that you do have a pencil. And furthermore, ain't is not standard English. Here's the thing. Miss W knew I was not confused, but if white kids picked up my bad habits and took them home to their white parents, Miss W would be blamed. She asked me to model the correct way to answer the question, may I have a pencil? At five, I had already learned how to suppress behaviors and personality traits that are justified to define black people as inferior. At 10, I became deliberately defiant. So I answered, I ain't got no extra pencil. Naturally, Miss W called my mother. I was in the kitchen making my usual PB and J sandwich after school. Ma walked in from work without making a sound. The back of her hand sailed across the table and popped my mouth. It stunned, didn't hurt. That mouth of yours, it's going to get you in trouble one day, she said. I knew that she was upset because I had defied the teacher. But she had her own code switching patterns. By the ninth grade, one English teacher accused me of plagiarism. She was later forced to give me a passing grade after an exhaustive search, finding no proof. I breezed through the language portion of the SATs. I didn't break a sweat over my college application essay. I got accepted into college and I was well on my way to a post-Civil Rights Act state sanctioned plan for upward mobility. My mother forced me to declare a political science major. It was a short conversation, went something like this. She said, your sassy mouth is best suited for arguing in a courtroom. I said, I would prefer to major in theater or literature. And she said, you don't look like Farrah Fawcett. So political science it was. On campus, I gave in to the spirit of personal freedom that was in the air in 1978. I gave in to the miles between me and the pressure to conform. Now I gave in to the reality that I liked practicing the hustle to McFadden and Whitehead more than I liked reading the constitution. It took me one year to flunk out. Back at home, the white world opened up for me, even without a college degree. When I called to ask companies if they were hiring, I intentionally sounded extra white. When I applied for office jobs, I looked for the ones that gave written tests because I tested white. I knew how to read and write the language of the dominant culture and navigate the systems they designed for their children. 17 years, 13 jobs, three evictions, three arrests, and two hospitalizations later. I had slipped into identifying myself through the gaze of whiteness. 
a gaze that judges a person's value based on how they measure up to standards set by white men. I was tricked into a distorted self-image. I thought that mediocre command of standard American English was a legitimate measure of intellect. And I have to reckon with that. By March, 1997, I was in state custody, undergoing a barrage of exams, including a test for language skills and vocational aptitude. This was in the reception unit at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women. I tested well enough to be given a job as a teacher's aide, a coveted role because it paid 12 cents an hour instead of seven cents an hour. Back then, New York State was still incarcerating children in adult prisons. It took one class of 16 and 17 year old black and Latina girls to set me straight. They called me snooty, <laughs> they called me bougie, they called me a snob, but eventually they called me Mama V. Language came to the rescue again. These girls didn't want me to stop code switching. They wanted me to teach them how to do it. Most were from communities that had under-resourced public school systems, and they'd never had a Miss W in their lives. They knew that when they got out, they would have a better chance of navigating this world if they spoke and wrote standard American English. But assimilation was not their goal. For them, standard American English was a tool to be used with precision, a cloak to be put on for cover, a weapon of self-defense, but never a replacement for truth. After three and a half years, I was released to serve the rest of my sentence on parole. I was back home with my mother. It was 30 years after Miss W. The town, still 92% white. And if I defined my success in the way that the parole system defines success, a job, a place to live, desistance from crime and abstinence from drugs, I would still be a clerk in the local hospital, which would have been fine if I felt that was my destiny but I didn't. My code switching rose to the occasion again. I reinvented myself and from the outside in, mine looked like the classic story of American resilience. I went from rags to middle-classness. I got a college degree with support from college and community fellowship. An organization I would eventually run for 16 years. The pieces of my life fell in place one after the other in a way that was almost surreal. But something was nagging me about my own narrative. I should have been shouting, started from the bottom, now I'm here. But I felt trapped a new captivity. I was tied to an identity that was shaped by the force of white dominance. And I had been the chief accomplice in my own identity theft. I worked with many women who struggled with speaking and writing standard American English in school and in the workplace. We paid for tutors and gave them the powers of code switching. Ironically, we were also fighting for equitable access to college and prison. It didn't occur to me to fight a different battle until May 25th, 2020. A boot on the neck 
triggered an avalanche of system and personal reactions. Never more clear that excellence is definitely not rooted in white hegemony. White dominance is dangerous, a threat to the entire planet. The past 16 months have seen unprecedented protests for racial justice. Gruesome examples of racially charged violence caught on camera have pricked the conscience of the nation and aggravated a lot of personal trauma. For-profit, nonprofit, and philanthropic corporations have rewritten mission statements and changed the language on their websites. Concepts like systemic racism, structural oppression, critical race theory, abolition, reparations are part of everyday conversations. Thousands of laws and policies to tinker with our system will be needed to weed out systemic racism. But no rule is as powerful as the unwritten and unconscious deference we give to the idea of white supremacy. When we call the traits of whiteness normal, correct, or standard, when the color nude is one shade, the effects are both systemic and personal. To an individual, it sometimes feels like the slow approach of a boot threatening to stomp out non-white identity. I will be 62 in January. I still struggle with the influence, the personal battles with white supremacy. Every day I adjust the lens. Is this thinking really mine or is it corrupted by the invisible influence of master code switcher? Facing the truth about my own history and mustering the courage to reckon with it is a tiny fragment in the atmosphere. I envision millions of fragments coming together to create an environment that is receptive to reckoning with the history of this nation, to do that in ways that heal and to require humans to be valued and power to be shared. The lures of white dominance are hidden in respectability and celebrity powerful traps. There are rewards that come with assimilation and we must face that truth. If spaces like these are truly the diverse, then they are by definition full of invisible trauma and pain. As we create the necessary list of policies that need to be changed and laws that need to be written, let this underlying question be a reframe. What are we doing about the trauma? Who is investing in spaces for healing? How can we process the idea of reckoning and then tell those stories of change? Racism is personal. So the best place to start is with you. Thank you.